The story um, takes place behind uh, this door right here in a small apartment in downtown LA where uh, a family has been experiencing uh, supernatural phenomena uh, for the past few months. So they contact a group of uh, peer psychologists. Alan is a single father struggling very hard to raise uh, an adolescent daughter, Caitlin, and uh, his four-year-old son, Benny, after the tragic death of their mother. We arrive to this house and we try and help. We talk to the family and we try and have interviews and we basically begin to observe. And very quickly, we observe that things start to go a bit awry. That are investigating or analyzing paranormal activity from a very scientific standpoint using real uh, scientific machinery and at the same time they, they, they have a very psychological approach to it. Uh, on the surface you may have poltergeist story but beneath there's a lot of subtext. There's a very rich and layered uh, human drama about a, a man who's trying to uh, keep his family together. What they want is that everything stop. That's what they really want. So they are not so worried about the facts, but about emotions. Rolling cameras! Okay, set, and action! Amerigo is an experimental horror film that uh, uses a, a whole new uh, kind of visual language. These people uh, come in and they set up a network of cameras all around the house so that they can document every single inch of the apartment and they can ensure that if anything out of the ordinary happens, they have it on camera. Most of this film is shot through security cameras or through cameras that the uh, characters themselves are operating. That introduces Im immediately the concept of a uh, point of view. You only see something if one of the real cameras is able to see it. I mean that we have different cameras. Some of them are surveillance cameras, and they are still, so you see what they see. Some others have robotized movements, and they react to real movements of characters. At the same time, one of these parapsychologists is always operating a camera. He always has a camera with him, so on top of the security cameras, he films everything that happens. Oh, well, what's happening? Yeah, not now, buddy. Probably one of the most brilliant things Carlos Torrens, the director, has done is break down each shot, how he can get his close-ups or his closer shots using the actors on film and giving them cameras and justifying their filming of the event and connecting it to the story. Some scenes and some shots uh, could be shot with five, six cameras at the same time, and some not. Some could only be only one. Right, because for most of the shots, I'm the one operating the camera. They really were willing about shooting in a wide variety of formats, like VHS, Hi8, uh, DV, HDV cameras, all that stuff. What really was challenging about this project is that they were willing to shoot it in a completely risky way, I think. There are moments uh, where uh, the director of photography is not able to get the shot simply because physically there's no room for him to move about. And so the best way would be to have the actual actor, myself or Ellen, you know, shoot the moment in real time, getting the, the scene. And then we do it again with um, Oscar standing in as Rick or I. Yeah. And what we do is we stand behind him and have physically have our hands on him, like on his belt, or Rick, or Rick generally has his hands on his shoulders and we run through the scene with him to make sure that we're not in shot and also to make sure that we say the lines at the right time. So every single shot in Amurgo is justified or is uh, obtained by a camera 
that the audience should know where it's at at every moment. We never fool, we never do tricks. If you see something, it's because there's a real camera there that is showing it for some reason. I'm trying to achieve with that is I want the audience to feel voyeuristic, to feel like they're watching something that they're not really supposed to be watching. You're basically the voyeur, you're basically the spy that's watching something that you're not supposed to be watching. To go and see Stay it. where you are for the final time. That's my daughter, the wife. My daughter. We have a whole film with a very scientific approach, but at the same time, somehow we have a drama. We have people in trouble. We have a family that are, are trying to find out who they really are. And my kids are suffering, and my adolescent daughter is uh, in the middle of one of the most difficult times in any young girl's life. And we have a strange girl who's trying to fight against what she thinks she is and her pulsions in a difficult age. I was told to be as miserable as possible. Fuck off. Leave me alone! Not supportive of the investigation in any way, shape or form. She's super rebellious and actually blames her father for everything that's going on. She's a lot of fun to play because she's very angry and distraught, very dramatic. Okay, roll camera, set, and action. There's gotta be some record of it. We took pictures of the entire living room. We have a multidisciplinary team of scientists that want to figure out what's happening. They only care about facts. It's not here, it's been deleted. Probably one of the most important directions I got to act as neutral and as scientific and as dispassionately as I could. Dr. Hauser to have an, an affinity with that kind of an experience and an ability to step into it professionally. Dr. Hauser, the head of the team, is uh, conducting the experiment and Ellen is uh, the point person for him and you know, organizing the entire investigation and I help in bringing all the equipment in and establishing every uh, utensil needed to conduct every experiment um, on this job. It's crazy, huh? Mm -hmm. He's the kind of person that doesn't take himself seriously and find the fun in the job working with Ellen. It's the secretary. Not secretary. No, you're the telephone girl. Not the telephone girl. No, you're the gatekeeper? Exactly. Exactly. Ellen still doesn't know she's the telephone girl. Ow. The character of Benny is a four-year-old kid. We saw few actors in L.A. that were about four or five or six, and uh, a lot of them felt very much rehearsed. Like, I would see the kids, and they were almost like robot childs. You know, they would recite the lines, and it didn't feel natural. So for a film as organic and natural and spontaneous as this, now we decided to go basically with a kid who wasn't an actor. And uh, so then I was lucky enough to find Damien Roman, who is a four-year-old kid who lives in Barcelona, but who's actually from Florida. So what I did is I took all of his scenes, put them together and sort of made them into a story, sort of like a fairy tale. Basically, we created a world for him. We met in the weekend rehearsals, we played lots of games. He never knew my name was Fiona, he just called me Ellen, which I, which I think mainly was that he wouldn't say the wrong name on set. We would basically have play dates where, you know, it'd be me and, uh, and the actors and Benny, and we'd have toy cars and we'd have all kinds of little gadgets, and we'd just be playing with them over and over and over until he became familiar with us, and he basically saw work as fun, as, as, as playing. You have to say that to Carlos, because you don't like Carlos. You know, I, don't like, I like Carlos. <laughs> who, do, who you do you like? Well, the location in this film was uh, pretty much the key element. Because um, it, I almost see the location as, a, as, a, as another character. 
because the whole film, the whole storyline takes place within these four walls, within a very confined space that's supposed to have a lot of personality. We wanted the, the whole film to feel claustrophobic, confined. I, I wanted the audience to be in there with the characters, sweating, reacting to, to the, the uneasiness of the situation. Encontramos un piso en particular que estaba muy bien ambientado, que el papel nos parecía perfecto, que podíamos modificarlo para que pareciese americano y luego lo complicado fue hacer los efectos en ese piso que ya nos mandaba mucho por su organización y por su porque era reducido. Eh, lo que hemos hecho es eh, ir fabricando pequeños artilugios artesanales, todo ha sido una nada sofisticado para hacer pues temblar los cuadros, para cerrar las puertas, para que se moviesen las lámparas. The physicality of, of what they've created for us um, is, has been pretty cool to work in, you know, so it, it's all really helped the actors to, to react to. They've literally like taken chairs and tables and the couch and bookshelf have done everything that they could to throw them at me. <laughs> You will really agree. So you call them or whatever. They will be dust, they will be different lights, there will be a lot of stuff like this. And you simply react, but also with the camera. Okay. So you have to get very specific kind of shots, trying to combine and trying to organize physical effects with visual effects. Um, the wind is is blowing in your face. The doors are banging. You know, it's very something. A lot of things have to fall. Sometimes we we have to shoot really difficult shots. We have all the crew doing something, even people from makeup or people from uh, costume or whatever, closing and shutting doors, bumping doors, or making noises or whatever. Everything when you. Uh, walk around, you can feel immediately that everybody is in the same ship. And that's something that rarely happens and it's a real joy. Side up. The last sequence of the film is really interesting. Once again, this was a very careful collaboration between our art department, our special effects team, our CG people, and our stunt team. Our te team of uh, stuntmen, they wired up the characters levitating to the ceiling so that now the CG guy was making sure they were doing it right so that later he could erase the cables. And then at the same time, the art department would have some fans hidden out outside of the frame shooting as much air into the room as they could uh, as they placed some props like papers and very light things that could be flying around to create a, a feeling of chaos. Well here we needed really brave people because at the beginning in meetings everybody say okay this is gonna be a very punky project this is gonna be great this is gonna be guerrilla but little by little people used to cover their asses and in this case this couldn't happen they were not allowed to do that because that was part of the philosophy it should be done this way in a very very straight and raw way so everything was absolutely believable and was fed by reality in real time there's something you will never have seen before you will be scared and hopefully you will be slightly moved by these people's predicament, the, the family particularly, but ultimately it's going to be a really, Emergo, it's going to be a really enjoyable film. Jesus Christ! Did you get that? Yeah. It, it makes it feel like you're watching a documentary. And, uh, and I think if you can capture a horror film in that tone, you know, then I think you might have something really like scary and at the same time really like disturbing in a way and 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 hopefully fun to watch oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. 
if you want to be truly scared and feel that the horror that you see on screen could actually happen, this is the movie for you because realism is our main concern and that's what I'm hoping to get. When I was a young man, my father liked to go to scary movies. And when he liked them, he said, you're going to shit your pants. So if you like scary films, Amergo's going to make you shit your pants.